I guess it, it goes back a long ways. Um, I first started just going out with elders and teaching people in young people in elementary school and uh, and uh, teaching people in my community about things. Um, I've been involved in a lot of different projects over the years. I uh, conducted ceremonies in the in the uh, penal institutions in the in the prisons um, and work I guess in education that way because a lot of the men who I worked with there had never experienced uh, much knowledge about their own own background and, and the indigenous culture that they came from a lot of them a lot of the men in prisons are are disassociated from their their communities um, and I as I said I worked within my own community and uh, trying to help people understand um, more about their culture, working with elders in that way. And then I started teaching at university. Um, I first uh, went to the university as a clinical counselor and um, with a focus on, on um, I guess back in the 90s, it was, it was really uh, building uh, programs that would help students integrate into mainstream institutions. Um, so students were coming to Queen's University from all over the country and helping them sort of sort things out as they encountered problems in the university um, and sort out some of the problems they were bringing with them. So uh, I think that was kind of an education in a way too. Um, but then I started teaching uh, with Evelyn Peters, who focuses a lot on Aboriginal urban life. And uh, then I started teaching courses on my own. And Queen's University is a very white school. It's a very, uh, um, except for the students who, uh, the foreign students, uh, primarily uh, Chinese and Arab students, um, it's a very white university. Um, so the courses that I've taught over the years have maybe five or I would say about five percent students with an Aboriginal heritage. Um, and so the focus of, of my Aboriginal education or Indigenous education at university has been mainly focused on helping non-Aboriginal people understand the Aboriginal experience in Canada. Um, and so I taught a course called Introduction to Aboriginal Studies. I taught a course called Topics in Aboriginal Studies, which was more about contemporary politics. And um, recently I've sort of moved into, in university, uh, uh, more Indigenous theory. Um, and I have taught four times now a course where we bring students out onto the land. After, after about eight weeks of theory, then we bring them out uh, for 10 days into the bush. <clears throat> we let them bring a, a, a knife and a sleeping bag, and, then, and we promise them that we'll give them a thousand calories a day and they have to find the rest. That way they're, they're sort of learning firsthand. They're immersing themselves a bit in, uh, in a relationship with the land and a relationship with one another uh, that has to be cooperative. That has to, and and that way they they learn why the, the theory uh, is uh, you know uh, important. I guess um, why they have to develop horizontal communities and horizontal leadership, uh, horizontal decision making. So that that makes it sort of real, and I, I like that a lot. Uh, but that's an expensive. Uh, form of education within universities for sure. Not so much in communities because communities, everybody comes and volunteers. We have lots of community volunteers come and help with that program. And for them, it's a bit of an education too, um, which is fun. Um, and I lately, um, in the last couple of years, what I've been doing is taking um, the introduction to Aboriginal studies, which I've taught at the university, at Queen's University, and offering it to local communities around my own community. Um, so 
we did a uh, 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 an eight week session in, in Sydenham, and then we went to Perth and uh, taught it three times, and uh, just for we just advertised it and ordinary people who've never been to university, some of them have. Um, but they want to know something about the Aboriginal experience in Canada. So, and some are Aboriginal people. I'd say about 10% of those people um, who live in those communities and are integrated into those communities um, come and take the course. So it's a bit of a mixture. And then uh, this last winter, we did a course in Kingston. Um, and so over that period of a couple of years, we actually were able to, Maggie and I worked on it together, and uh, we were able to get about 150 people much more um, educated as to what's going on with Aboriginal people in Canada. What, 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 what's the meaning of what they hear in the news? Um, and I think one of the interesting things that comes out of that community education, and it's all volunteer, I, I don't do it for any money or anything like that. Um, but um, what comes out of that, uh, this gentleman came up to me, and he is about 65 years old, probably retired from his, his occupation. And he said, you know, I, I lived through a lot of that, things, things that you were teaching. Um, and I knew about them, but I never knew how to analyze them. And that's really, really important in Aboriginal education, is giving people the tools to be able to take the, the data or the uh, uh, examples and be able to uh, sort of take them apart and, and understand what the, uh, 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 you know, how they, how, they, how they came about and what happened while they were going on and what, what the consequences of, of a particular event might be. So, and how, how that relates to them as settlers. And one of the interesting things that's happening, you know, the first time I, I heard the term settler used was an elder in my community, always referred to the white people around us as, uh, as settlers. And, uh, you know, people, I hadn't, I hadn't heard people use that term before, but that, and that was about 40 years ago. And since then, a large portion of the Canadian population actually, well, at least the, the population of younger people can refer to themselves as settlers and know that that's a, um, a, a term that requires them to do some thinking and do some analyzing and, and, and do some growing. Um, so it's not, it's not a negative term, but it's a term that really places people or positions people who need to know more about Aboriginal people. So there, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but uh, yeah, I have this very sort of eclectic or very horizontal mm -hmm. process of, that I've been involved in in teaching. I make a, uh, as I said before, I, may, I make a very distinct difference between Aboriginal education and Indigenous education. Um, all human beings, all human beings in the womb have no expectation of being born into a modern world. We have 150 or 200,000 years of genetic development that helps us become Indigenous because the majority of, of human life has been Indigenous. And so we have all of the emotional, intellectual tools to live Indigenous lives and to be educated uh, from birth on as Indigenous people. Um, but as soon as we're born, we get weighed, uh, we get measured, uh, the, the complexion of our skin is recorded, our parents' ethnicity is recorded, uh, and then we, do, we are assigned an identity um, which then uh, determines the course of our education. And for an Aboriginal child, that means the course of education will be to be integrated into a larger culture because they're presumed not to be. And for the non-Aboriginal person, they're assumed to be already integrated. 
even though they've got 150 or 200,000 years of genetic development that tells them that they're supposed to be something else. So as, ch as children, they struggle away, uh, you know, and learn to fit into a world too. Um, that's quite foreign from the what we're prepared to do as human beings. So indigenous education, if you use the term indigenous education, that's learning how to live with, with our, our, the ecosystems that we're relating to, that we relate to. Um, and that is very far and few between. Those lessons are few and far between unless, you know, as indigenous people or as a people of indigenous heritage, we're more close to people who are close to that uh, and have that education uh, through a, a familial or community relationship with the land and with the ecosystems around them and the lessons that they need to know out of, of that. Um, very few people are fortunate that way anymore. Um, being raised on reserve does not guarantee that you're going to have an indigenous education. In likelihood, you're going to have an education that um, is an Aboriginal education that teaches you to integrate into a larger society. Um, and even your peers and your, your family will put pressure on you to move in that direction because that's where success is considered to be found. Um, that's, that's where... Aboriginal education in the family, you know, sort of takes over. And um, for most people who are non-Aboriginal, who are not of Indigenous heritage to this land, they, uh, um, they're they taught to sort of just ignore that uh, because it's periphery, it's, um, it's, um, it's orientalized, it's... Um, it's the other, and it's it's really it's peripheral to their success. So they're taught to ignore it, yeah. although it's really really important um, because to know the land around you, to know the environments around you, the ecosystems around you, you know, you can learn the names of trees, but if you don't know how the trees relate to each other or to the soil, uh, you don't really know very much. Um, and most people in this world, in this modern world, um, that's as far as they get, is just knowing that what a maple leaf looks like. But if they were asked to identify the bark of a maple tree, they wouldn't know what they were talking about. So, but they do know um, Shakespeare and <laughs> uh, they know geometry and arithmetic and all of that stuff, which is, those are important things. But, uh, um, so that's the complexity here, is that we live in a society where some people are taught that um, indigenous education or the kind of, kind of education that we're, we're actually born to have um, is periphery to us and, and not important. Um, and we're taught that the, that the information that we should have um, is, is really, really important for our overall success. And that's to... Uh, profit from our education. I started, it's, you know, I mean, I've gone through an education myself. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, my interest was on, on the rights discourse. Um, w uh, the community that, that I belong to, the Arduk Algonquin First Nation, um, uh, a few older people were still around. And they reminded a lot of us younger people how important their indigenous knowledge was. Um, so when their wild rice stands, they still harvested wild rice, they did other things. But when those wild rice stands were challenged by the government and a commercial harvester, uh, they asked us to fight with them. And we did. And so we really focused in on understanding what our rights were as Aboriginal people in Canada. <clears throat> and we saw that there was a great, um, a larger movement outside of our community that was also preoccupied with the same ideas and the same 
the request to, to have those rights recognized and established. And we worked on that. But as we worked on that, I think we matured and, and we also saw that, um, and, they, and the elders, I think, reminded us of this, is it not, wasn't just a matter of rights, but there were responsibilities. Um, that the responsibilities outweighed the rights discourse. And to learn those and learn and live those responsibilities was more important, um, which changed our whole sort of, it changed my strategy of looking at things. And as I began to try to understand those responsibilities, uh, it also became evident that I needed to learn a lot more about the land and about my relationship with the land and how the things that I had learned as a child were applicable to that knowledge. Um, and so I moved from there to an idea of, let me understand what, what re-indigenization is. You know, this isn't just a, an academic um, exercise. This is really something about um, reimagining re re and doing. And so I started to study re-indigenization. And then and this is where the 10 years comes in. Um, I started looking at who was looking at the future uh, because if I wanted to, to work on educating others, educating myself as to what this whole re-indigenization process might look like uh, and, and how it was going on in other places and to recognize it, um, I had to have an idea of what the world was like 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And so I started studying and researching um, those who were actually uh, taking a look at that. Um, so I found out that most of the major corporations now have departments that are dedicated to future studies. Even, even the Goddard Space Institute at NASA, uh, because they want to put a man on, on people on Mars in 50 years, they need to know what the world's going to look like in 50 years. So, and it, and it, you know, sort of my practical mind said, that's important stuff to know, because if indigenous people are going to survive, if indigenous cultures are going to survive, um, and if those of us who have been alienated from our indigenous roots want to reclaim it, then we have to also know what the world's going to look like in 10 years or 20 years. And frankly, that's a nightmare. Um, <clears throat> colonialism is um, collapsing uh, of its own weight, uh, but imperialism is still rampant. Um, the imperial states are still, you know, they think their survival is is so important they're willing to um, uh, negate the survival of other people. And uh, that makes this whole process of re-indigenization difficult, not just for people of Aboriginal uh, identity and indigenous heritage, but everyone. Um, so, um, that sort of changed things to where it became important to look at, um, the processes and the strategies. And I guess this is where my education is going now. My own education and what I'm doing with students is helping them look into the future a bit and to see what qualities, really to know what, it, what indigeneity is rather than look at it just from a rights perspective, uh, because our, our responsibility is to survive. And so we need to look at things like cultural drift. Why do indigenous cultures um, um, change? How do, they, how do they move from sort of uh, one set of narratives to another set of narratives, and why do they do that? Um, what's, and we need, and because we have access now, I mean, it's amazing that we have access to genetics, how the, how the, the genetic and cultural um, co-evolution takes place. Because clearly over the last 
hundred thousand years. There's been a, a tremendous shift in uh, or evolution in, in genetics and culture, and they work together. So that's part of indigenous studies, I think, in 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 my mind, is to help us understand how that happens. Those are the kind of things I'm interested in. I'm also, you know, as as I've grown, I've also recognized that there's less and less of difference between Aboriginal people and settlers. Um, that while there are clearly differences in economic conditions, there's clearly differences in who can exercise particular rights. Um, most settlers, or while they don't live in overt oppression, they live in very closed systems. Um, and they're not allowed to move out of those systems. The same way that, that our ancestors found themselves living in, in, in you know, worlds that they knew intimately and then being excluded from those worlds. Um, you know, most settlers don't live intimately with the world around them. And so they've already been conditioned out of um, learning about living naturally with, with the world around them. And uh, you know, sort of waking them up to that too. Mm. I'm not very satisfied with the course that institutions have taken. Um, most institutions are now buying into, or most Aboriginal people within the institute, within the educational institutions, are buying into, you know political reconciliation. And uh, this is about the evolution of um, uh, of colonial society. It's not about the evolution. Of, it's not directed toward the real evolution of our own societies and our own cultures. Um, we're being taught uh, to sit in the back of the bus. That's what, in my mind, that's what, what reconciliation is. It's, it's being taught to sit in the back of the bus and be happy with that. Uh, because it doesn't give us rights to land, it doesn't give us uh, autonomy, or it doesn't give us sovereignty over the, you know, the, the course of, of development, or the course of how land is used. Um, and so that's really problematic, and I find that a lot of uh, departments of Aboriginal studies are going along with this idea of indigenizing the institutions. Well, these institutions are medieval Europe in European institutions. I mean, the university, the hospital, well, not so much the hospitals, but, but certainly the, the, inst uh, the, the universities, the churches, um, that we belong to are, are what we call democratic governments are all medieval institutions, medieval European institutions. And uh, they come out of a, a period, you know, that we refer to as the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment, you know, was a way in which sus European societies were allowed to live well because others suffered. And uh, that's not the qualities um, are the philosophy or the spirituality of indigenous people. And that's that I'm really worried about, is that we can become just as, um, we can become co-conspirators with, with our enemy. Um, so we have to be really vigilant when we work within the institutions. We have to be confederates. <laughs>